Good evening, everybody. Welcome back to Louisville, Kentucky. I am Matt Bamonte on the Energy Series. Getting ready to kick off round number six here. Let's talk a little bit about our players to watch as we start to shake out the last couple of rounds of Swiss here. You got Adam Wasburn, Moses, Jesse Robkin, and Connor all at four and one on the day. You just watched Zach Allen at three and two. And then down there towards the bottom, Raja Suleiman, Mac Endress, Will Kruger, and Zoe Rudiman all checking in at two and three. So not exactly the Sunday that they wanted as they're chasing down some points here in our season 22 leaderboard, but about as good as it's going to get there for Connor. He is uh, one match ahead of Zach Allen, and you'll see just a moment why that matters on our leaderboard. And there it is. So Connor's was leading going into this morning at 173 points, uh, one point lead over Zach Allen for our player of the year. Now you might be asking what's so important about player of the year. So just a couple of things here. So they are going to receive whoever that player is at the end of the day receives free entry into all of our events next year, all of our main events next year. So those Saturday, those, uh, those big showdowns that are going to auto qualify someone to our championship every weekend. They're going to get free entry to those. And they also get a, uh, a player swap in our championship. So uh, if you want more details kind of about how that works, make sure to head over to nerdragegaming.com. You can check out the articles tab and uh, MaxCon does a great job of breaking that down. Even someone like me can understand how the uh, championship format structure works as well as uh an announcement about next year's events. If you're looking to attend one, you can see our awesome slide here. So the player of the year race, like we said, comes down to this today. So Connor looking to solidify himself as our player of the year. And uh, with that, we're about ready to kick off round number six. So I'm going to send you down to Mason. It looks like Joe's for joining us back. So you guys have a great time. And it is round number six out of seven here in Louisville. All right. Thanks, Matt. And we are back for round number six of Pioneer. Now we've got Michael Belfado and Connor Mullally. Uh Connor in contention for the player of the year. And we have, we decided, you know, what's the ideal viewing experience for a Pioneer format, Mason? And we came up with the Mono Green Mirror. Yeah, it's really just the pinnacle of interactive and exciting gameplay of the back and forth. And honestly, jokes aside something you have to get good at and you have to sort of understand the intricacies of if you're going to succeed in pioneer it's really easy to joke around and be like yeah nick this is what matters but there is more to it than that and connor has been dominant this year in our circuit playing mono green had a great uh, finish at the rc as well coming up one match point shy of the pro tour playing this deck and has shown a mastery for it and you don't win as much as connor is just by always having nick this you've got to understand the intricacies of the ins and outs sure and and so the deployment of this deck i mean Really building up, we know the cyborging doesn't really exist. So all all everything that would apply to game one to game two, it all is the same here. We're playing the same game basically three times in a row, trying to build up an edge and win two out of three here, as we always are. And Michael Belfado fighting from the draw, which is not ideal, but uh, I mean something you have to have experience with. Like you're saying, you have to you have to make it happen. Yeah, it's just, it's going to happen to you about half the time, you know, regardless of what people say. And, you know, you're just going to, it's going to happen. If you play a deck like this, sometimes you're going to draw and your deck's still strong enough to break ahead. Now, Connor does have Cityscape Leveler lined up for the next turn off his card in the Great Creator, along with a bunch of elves to play it. So it's going to be hard for Michael to get out from this spot unless he has something in crazy like a card of his own. But, you know, also... Maybe Connor's, you know, using his best draws while he's on the play. You know, you got yeah, save your best draws around the draw sometimes. As Michael is sort of pondering over, okay, what exactly can I do? Sequencing in this turn is so so important, especially with Connor having the cityscape level over it. And Michael's decided, you know what the best thing I can do is Joe is let us talk about their sideboards. Yeah, I mean, sometimes, <laughs> sometimes that's the case. Sometimes your opponent just has the nuts, and you just accept your loss and move on. And it's important to stay, you know, within yourself and say, like, hey, you know what? I was likely disadvantaged game one anyway. So the fact that Connor has the nuts, you know, just ignore that and go on. So, okay, we can look at the deck list. We can look at the sideboards. There are a couple slots in the green list that are kind of, you know, up there for customization. And Michael Belfado has uh, chosen to go back in time a little bit. We have the green splash for Vraska. Yeah, this is a big difference. So by having the Vraskas in the main deck, Michael's a little bit better better against aggro decks. He's a little bit removal. That's kind of nice. And being on the play in this matchup can blow up something like an elf that could matter. But more importantly, we have 
the uh neck the ugin's nexus mm -hmm. which with karn gives us infinite turns so we actually can combo much cleaner and quicker than connor can and we can beat things like the stone brain uh in different ways as well so we actually have a couple different ways to actually win a game here and if, you know if we just get ahead on board we might be able to actually you know cross the finish line even if we couldn't full combo so this deck a little bit different not as like streamlined as the normal Honor green but in the head-to-head -head, slightly favored in some draws and uh, we're gonna see that happen as we also see michael has teferi who slows the sunset that is sort of the card for going fast in the mirror mm -hmm. we've seen players adopt nico bolas dragon god as a way to hey if you the stone brain me i then have access to your karn's ability so i can still access my sideboard michael's like i'm not really interested in doing that i would like to vroom vroom go fast and He's sort of doing that and combine that with Raska. He's had, you know, a gr great start here today and has a very potent modern green deck. His Storm of the Festivals are much stronger than Connor's. All right, so we'll go ahead and take a look at Connor's list. So no extra Planeswalkers here. Connor does have Nicol Bolas. And let's see, do we see a couple copies of Love, Love Strike Beast? It looks like one. one. Yeah, okay, one. And then the main deck, Sky Sovereign. Okay, so that's the way... Connor chose to go with kind of this flex plots in the deck, which is it's basically it's it feels like a lot of lists have two love struck beasts. So you want know, to say mm -hmm. two, maybe uh you know, three or four in um in Michael's case, as far as cards that are just not exactly stock. And so your the advantage in Michael's deck, you're talking about speed, uh easier of comboing. So what advantages is Connor picking up with Love Struck Beast on the other side? So Connor is citing to be a little bit worse in the mirror match and the sort of matches where speed matters and is saying, hey, Mono White is one of the best performing decks from the RC circuit. Players love to play aggressive decks. I'd like to have this card in my deck. It's still something that triggers my Kiora and can be kind of good in the mirror matches if I get ahead on board. But for the most part, between that and the Sky Sovereign, Connor's chosen for two of his three flex spots to be more targeted towards the mono white deck specifically and creature decks in the whole. So Connor, a little bit stronger versus the field at large there. And looking over Connor's matches from today, he beat an abs and grease fang player already. And he beat some mono blue spirits players and having things like that, those cards actually allow that to happen. We're going heavier on the combo is not going to be helpful there. Okay. So Michael looking at nobody hands. So we're looking for, well, I guess we're always looking for the same, same things. We're looking for an elf. We're <laughs> yeah. looking for, something like Kiora or old gold troll something that provides early devotion and uh well connor didn't find it so he's going back to six and so maybe we should just pass along to connor after having watched some of the air matches today six is the number of cards we're looking for here <laughs> yeah six is what you're going for six is what you get and this is a huge part of the mono green deck joe just as i'm sure you can speak from lotus field if you don't mulligan aggressively and correctly yeah. with this deck you might as well just not play the deck no, you know, you're right. And, and, and sometimes it's evident where a player keeps their hand and you just see them, you know, play maybe in this case, a bunch of elves or no elves. And mm -hmm. neither one of those options is really where you want to be at. And you have to be disciplined in order to ensure those hands. Because, I mean, it's it's not hard to imagine. In fact, last game we saw Connor just having an overwhelming win and probably had two or three cards in hand that were completely unused. Oh, so, 100%. Yeah, you, you don't need seven. All right, yeah. so here's an elf to start off from Michael. And... Connor will match. Now, Michael's elf much prettier than Connor herself. Absolutely. And granted, it's you know black border. When you when you have that, you know the original artwork, the preferred option is the white border. But okay, Michael, you don't lose too many points for that. And old growth troll to join up. <laughs> and it does look like Connor's going to have a turn three play. Just figure out which one he prefers to go with here when behind on board to the old growth troll. Yeah. I noticed the art. Oh, by the way, I went back and watched my future match from yesterday. There was a lot of Joe Lissette doesn't like Mason's art choices conversation going on. I mean, that's 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 not specific to you. That's a lot oh. of those. Mm, okay, well, as long as it's not specific <laughs> to me, that's understandable. I had some white water cards and I fell attacked. But you know what? We, we, that's all fair stuff. That's all fair <laughs> stuff. As Michael here has more mana to deploy. All right, so attack over here. And all right, elves attacking. I mean... That's fine, but that's not really the ideal scenario here in the early game for the for the green devotion decks. Yeah, if you're Connor, you are really happy with that. Now you're not super happy your Kigoli only has one loyalty, but even still just having it allows you to play things like an old growth troll and get that redraw, which I think we're gonna see Connor do right now. Mm -hmm. All right, so there's the pickup there. Uh ooh, two layer of the hydras. That's not exciting. 
I think it's two layers Nykthos. Oh, it's layer Bosager Nykthos. Okay, okay. So lots of mana available, but not much to do. Okay, turn back to Michael here. And I think we kind of glossed over this in the moment, but uh, Michael short a third land drop last turn. Mm -hmm. And also he his black source with the Vraskan hand, he had to make it the pathway for the old growth troll. So having a little bit of awkwardness there as both players, you know, just like, okay, old growth trolls are coming down. This is what happens. Oh, storm. All right. Storm festival looking for chunky plays. And do we find. Yeah. Teferi Kiora. All right. That, that's good. This is what I was talking about, by the way, when we were sideboarding where Michael's storms are just much stronger. Having things like Teferi on this board state, even you can just, you know, uptick your stuff, get to replay a little bit. Like, for example, we can untap the elf, untap the old gross trolled land, and we could make the token if we wanted to, and then suddenly draw another card. So a lot of options available for Michael here. As it looks like he's maybe wanting to do that. He could even minus the Kiora to untap the token so it's not tapped. So kind of got a lot of plays available to him. All right. Yeah, just going to be Kiora to untap. And another, okay, another five mana and Cavalier. Okay, cool. well, this is this is playing fair, but it's playing fair really, really well. <laughs> yeah, this is some big, I'm playing fair, Joe, <laughs> in like big air quotes as we see the path we get taken off here. Well, it, it's more fair than than the Cityscape level over that came out real quick last game from Connor. That's, that, that's you know what? Good point. Touché, we're playing, touché. We're playing on a curve here. This, this The standards have been established in this matchup. <laughs> that's Ooh. fair. Also, worth noting, Connor pointed out, you know, hey, that pathway does need to come in on the front side. It being black, maybe not great for this turn, but does unlock the Vraska here for Michael on the next turn as mm -hmm. Connor picks up the Oathanism. All right. Oath, this needs to hit something good here. <laughs> what if uh, I told you a forest? I, uh, I would be unexcited. Understandable. Have a nice day. As I think that might be what Connor's saying here as he thinks about, well, do I keep playing? I should probably keep playing. <laughs> stuff, crazier stuff has happened. He also does have, I'm, I am joking a little bit, but he has Nykthos activation, pop the troll, make the token draw a card. So Connor is not without plays here. As you know, he will be going down to five mana in order to get in. Ripped a Cavalier of Thorns. So, hey, we have, you know, just exactly five left. Might as well use it on something important. Yeah, all right, all right, let's see it from Connor. With uh, he's gonna need a lot because while Michael is sitting on just one big creature, but he's sitting on two big planeswalkers with more in hand. So Cavalier will continue on for Connor. Uh, looks like one green floating. Is there another Nykthos? No, not another Nykthos. I think Connor picked up the second Bosaju in hand as well. So if Connor can stabilize, that will keep him safe from any sort of wild Nykthos turns. But he does sort of have to sweat it here for a little bit. We see him sort of just figuring out, do I want to, you know, cash in the cure to untap the troll? Maybe, maybe not. Don't know which land I want to play for turn. Because it matters too. Like having a second layer to play right now might seem like small potatoes but later in the game that sort of thing of developing for now can really matter no yeah those layer of the hydras do tend to get when they get powered by nykthos they do swing for big chunks of damage even you know the size of michael's life total with no difficulty mm -hmm. and worth mentioning too michael does not have nykthos yet so that's mm -hmm. one thing in connor's camp but we have these two untappers, so our old growth troll land is going to go wild. And regardless of what's in Michael's hand, we still have Storm the Festival in the graveyard as some relooks at the combo. As we are going to see, uh, Besage go after the old growth troll land in order to try and actually actually go for the old growth troll itself because old growth troll is an enchantment when on the land. A very sneaky play. Mm -hmm. All right, so that finds an overgrown tomb, and I believe Michael's last draw last turn was. Nykthos. So even though Connor sees the coast being clear as far as Nykthos goes, I believe I think it is there waiting. Yeah, I think so too. Looks like Michael's just double checking his deck. Maybe thought he put some cards in the wrong way off a of bottom with a you know storm. Yeah, yeah. Happens to everyone. Just want to make sure you know our deck's presenting the correct way. And yeah, right. I think he did. If he if he did, if you're right about Nykthos, this is going to be a wild turn here from Michael. Yeah. Mm 
Yeah, Storm of the Festival would have no trouble being being flashback. And I wonder if Connor's play would have been different if he had because I think he had one floating mana plus the forest. And if he had, you know, two land untapped, if he could have held the Basaju through Michael's turn, I wonder if that would have been the play instead of shutting down that troll early. Perhaps not. But yeah. here we go. Without having the option, uh, it does just fire it off there and it's, all, it's also awkward because, you know, Connor can't target basic lands. Those are basics mm -hmm. from Connor, so he had to target yeah. the troll. So, All right, here is Nykthos followed, following an elf. And, all right, Michael, it's your turn to go for the glory here. All the mana in the world. Six green, I've from my count, unless there's an Othanissa hiding out somewhere. Looks like it's seven. All right, you got me. And... It's going to put us up to, I believe that's representing 12. <laughs> oh, no, we're using it all. Oh, sorry, sorry. Okay, okay. Yeah, and we're going down to two here as we flashback Storm the Festivals. That's what Michael is grabbing there. And Okay, what do we got? We have Karn and we have a land. All right, yeah. that fits. I mean, you can't hit too many Planeswalkers. They're already in play. And yeah, yeah Connor's done. Okay. Yeah, Michael has combo. He has Teferi. It looks like. Yeah, Connor's like, I'm going to hold my lands. You just make sure that you have the chain veil real quick, and I'll concede if you do. Michael's like, I do. Connor's like, sounds good. <laughs> Let's shuffle our cards back up. All right. Yeah. Connor Mullally, experienced player with this deck, doesn't need to see the steps taken by Michael Belfado, willing to admit that the game is in hand. So we go towards a game three. Uh, no reason to look towards sideboards. I think, again, as uh, the players know what's going on, um, and the players know what they're playing for, or at least, I mean, Michael Belfado playing for, I mean, this is a 5K for him. For Connor Mullally, it means a lot more than that, as um, the player leader's spot is his for the taking at the moment. Mm -hmm. And uh, we'll uh, we'll see how the rest of the day finishes out, whether he can clinch that spot, uh, clinch the free entries for next year, and also the swap in the, out, out of the pods. And that, that'll be interesting yeah. to see, too. Whoever does get that, um, you end up in a you know small field championship like that, and you have some minor advantage for yourself but also you're friendly with you know most of the field um which means you're probably more informed to make your decisions but also you're liable to maybe hurt somebody's feelings yeah it, it's all business here and right. speaking of hurt, hurting feeling the player of the year this is also a big pride thing for connor so connor last year joe missed our players championship yeah. by one point yeah, and you know i'm a friend with connor's and he walked outside and he was like I'm going to just win player of the year next year and win the champs. That was his goal for this year. That's what he wanted. And to get player of the year, he is in his grasp. Connor has kept his eye focused on this above literally everything else except not dying and surviving. This is his number one priority. And this matters for him a bunch. So this is a huge pride point for him. And you know that regardless of what happens to champs, whether he gets player of the year or not, say if Jesse Razak does, he is going to do his best to win that at work at minimum. And like you mentioned, that swap of the pod is huge. Just pretend, you know, like if you test with one of your friends and you know that maybe they're better at the matchup than you swap it with someone that tends to play a deck that's worse against your sort of thing. Sure. That's super mm -hmm. big. A lot of little things that can go on there, you know? So like you mentioned, it's a huge upgrade. And for Connor, it's a huge incentive and a huge pride thing. He is someone who takes a great play in his pride and has done a lot of work this year to crush our circuit and be our number, potentially our number one player of the year. Mm -hmm. All right. Players shuffling up, getting ready to present for game number three. Yeah. We feel like the swap is, is a, is a nice little perk, but also not, not you're going to humiliate, humiliate anybody too much. The, uh, I know for familiar with some players might be with the Starcraft GSL league in Korea, the way their playoff works is the number one overall seed. They play in pods of four gets to choose their first. They, they pick an order of, Who's going to be in my pod? So basically the number one player picks who they think is the worst player in the field. And that's who gets, you know, and they do it on stage and, and it's just, it's rough. That, that, that's, that's, that's the prison yard in our G circuit where we have that one happen. <laughs> so it looks like our match is starting here. Could you imagine, you talk about hurting feelings, Joe, that's the no. one that hurts feelings. No, you know, I, for know. The, <laughs> yeah. no I know. That's why I brought it up because it is, it's, it's rough. Honestly though, knowing Connor, Connor would choose whoever he thinks is the best to put as his opponent. That's just the kind of gamer Connor is. Connor's like, hey, you know, whatever, Piper, Piper, you're the best. I'm playing you round one. That's just the kind of gamer Connor is as we see a Kiora slam down here. 
All right. Yep. Uh, both players, I think, keeping seven for this game. And, oh, are we playing over? Wow. Michael is attacking with Lenore Elves more than I've ever seen anyone on turn two, and it breaks my heart for him. <laughs> yeah, and it's tapped over on Tomb. I mean, you could, I mean, if the players weren't fully aware of what was going on, I mean, you could just shock that in just a bluff because you're not going to gain, the life toll is not going to make too much of a difference. And, wow, no play there. And Connor, anything but no play as a Cavalier comes in here, uh, pick up a card and hopefully a land. Yeah, and five cards off the top here. Looks like we did hit a Nykthos, so looks like Connor is going to grab a Forest. Probably already has a Nykthos in hand. Maybe wants to develop something like a Lanor Elves this turn. Or just, you know, if I already have a Nykthos, no reason to burn one. Don't have uh, too, too much Nykthos in play, yeah. Oh, yeah, it's in play. That's the promo Nykthos. I, I know the old school. That's right when I started playing, Joe. So that's my Nykthos. That's where my boomer stuff starts, you know? Uh, okay. <laughs> okay, well, keep that in mind. All right. For Michael, uh, a Karn uh, tapped out. So we know this Karn is not going to survive. I'm not even confident Michael's going to survive, but we'll see. Yeah, and it looks like maybe this is why Michael kept his hand. He maybe had, you know, not too much to do on turn two, but had a Karn lined up, maybe even has another piece of the combo in hand. It was like, well, if I high roll a Kiora, I high roll a Kiora. Mm -hmm. All right, so Connor going along here. So, okay, so you know Connor. Uh, is that uh, the Seascape Leveler that's in the graveyard there? Uh, it is. Connor did not put that in his sideboard uh from game one he just shuffled it into his deck and then also because game two lasted so shortly connor uh did that i do not believe that's part of his sideboarding it might be an homage to when he played against jesse robkin in the showdown finals that he won and jesse left in her meteor golem on accident so maybe right. it's just like you know like you know jesse when you go back and watch this you know and you lost player of the year to me I, I, this one was for you <laughs> as we see old gross troll get played here all right so Perhaps sideboarding mishaps aside, Connor Mullally looking quite strong here against uh, Michael Belfado's start, which was uh, below par, probably. And all right, Connor is not done yet. Yeah, he might be uh, unearthing okay. the, the cityscape leveler after activating Nykthos here. As we do see 12 mana. Yeah, oh, he has Dragon God and Storm. The wow, Connor's got a lot of it right now. <laughs> All right, Storm here. So I don't believe there's an Oath of Nissa. So Dragon Nickel Ball is stuck in hand for the moment, but Storm of the Festival can hit Oath of Nissa, which would enable that. Although it does not just, oh, you know, ah. casual eight mana worth of, of green beaters that come with additional cards and land drops. Yeah, it looks like Connor picked up Nykthos and something there and gets another look here to find more mana. Just why not? And uh, like we mentioned before, it's not even like for Michael's side, this all interplay this turn. We have to untap with the car and have a shot. The car is dying. Mm -hmm. So Michael's going to need something to really sort of pop off here. And you see Connor here just double checking to make sure, like, what's the best thing I can do? Looks at his graveyard again, wonders how much is, you know, the unearthed on the cityscape leveler. Even if leveler came out, I mean, <clears throat> what are we even, are we, are we picking off the elf? Which is just going to, I, it's slightly better. Yeah, right? it's better. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Oh no, we, oh, we found boy. the oath. <laughs> oh no! All right, all right. This is going to be tough, and there's a Karn as well. So let's see. Uh, we got Nicobolus now castable, which uh, can yeah be cast off the oath. That can do whatever Connor would like. Yeah, kill the elf and kill the Karn. And Michael Bafado is not having any of that. Connor Lily advances to five and one, looks to be in prime position to draw in the next round and top eight this event. If not, he is going to for sure have a winning in situation. So mm -hmm. congratulations to Connor there, putting himself in a great position. And you can see why going into this last event of the year, he is our number one player on the year. Even if it's just by a margin, that margin do be mattering. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it looked impressive stuff, looked knowledgeable. And uh, we're going to talk with Connor in a moment about his prospects, maybe for plans he has for the championship. Another thing, so while we'll wait a few minutes while Connor makes his way over to the interview area. In small field here, uh, and being, I mean, a lot of the players that do well in the series are friendly with each other. If Do you think, do you, I mean, how big of a team do you want to work with when you're preparing for a small field event like this? 
Yeah, I, I was talking about this with some of the players because I, I do know a bunch of the players qualified. And I think that two people is probably the optimal number. I think if you get to three, maybe it's okay, but you're getting really close. To, like that's a large percentage of the field when you have mm-hmm. three people on your team. And right. I think four is illegal, you know, not to the extreme. It's just like, if you're playing with four people, I don't know what's exactly going on there. Yeah. But yeah. I, mean, I, I, I would guess too, but you've played, you know, the SCG players mm-hmm. championships. Yeah. What was your testing team size? Uh, generally it was, it was me working with someone who was not in the field. Oh, so zero, uh, zero in yeah. field. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. It was never, that's, I mean, you know, geographically, like I wasn't, you know, I didn't have mm-hmm. tight friendships with a lot of these people because I didn't live in the same part of the country as many of them did. Mm-hmm. And, and so, uh, I went in basically solo, um, which, uh, which was okay with me. Um, and there was, you know, going in with, you know, trying to predict the fields, um, some change ups, some kind of off the wall choices by several people, including me to try to throw off kind of the prevailing wisdom. But here, I mean, these players, yeah, if you, if you grew up with four, even five players, I mean, you're looking at 20% of the field or more. So certainly there, there are advantages to keeping, keeping things kind of close because unless you want to play a bunch of mirrors all day long, uh, you, uh, it's maybe not in your best interest to, um, to grow up with everybody. Well, anyway, we'll see what Connor thinks about it. Mm Mm-hmm. When he is right, I can see him sitting on the chair. So we'll get him uh, popped in here as soon as it's ready to go. Connor, can you hear us? Oh, hey, Mason. All right. I can well, hear you. Okay. Congratulations, Connor. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Five and one and looking strong. So Mason, Mason was talking about, uh, you know, for some people qualifying for the championship, like that's a great, you know, that's a big achievement. You, He said you really have your eye on the MVP. So for me, qualifying for the championship was a big achievement. I was the first one out last year to mm-hmm. to have the chance to compete there is awesome. Um, to be MVP would just mean the world. And so I I think I'm there. Um, obviously, You're, things can still go wrong, but mm-hmm. we're going to see what happens in the last round. You here. are certainly very much on your way, and you've done mm-hmm. basically all you can to uh, to make that happen. So um, and we're we're talking about, you know, kind of the scope of the of the content changes a little bit with some players who are battling out yeah. to try and top eight the 5k some players are trying to get the championship you're just looking to be on top you're trying to cement your position mm-hmm. so what we were just talking about as far as the championship itself goes 16 players small field yep have you put any thought into maybe you have not yet at this point but have you put any thought into like how many people you want to work with this event kind of what kind of preparation you think you might do uh, I'm going to be working with Piper Powell, um, who would have been the player of the year if she came to all of the events. Mm-hmm. Um, very, very good player. Um, I'm really looking forward to working with her. I think she's excellent. And then I think we're just going to, yeah, try to have good decks, try to have good plans for everybody. Um, I am far from the best player in the field. And so I usually try to win on the deck registration sheet. Okay. All right. Well, it's somewhat modest there, but, and we've got two formats going in modern and pioneer. Mm-hmm. Um, do you feel like uh, one of those formats is likely that uh, the two of you will have an edge in more than the other one over the field? Personally, I'm a lot more comfortable in Pioneer. Um, all of my top eights on NRG this year have been with green. I've played a lot of Lotus in the past, and that's always a possibility going into a small field tournament like this. And it's also a lot easier to narrow down what you think the field is going to be just because there's so so many fewer playable decks, whereas modern, there's just so many things that people could do. It's It's really hard to nail that down. Mm-hmm. Connor going like you mentioned this in the field and everything how excited like are you because I can tell right now like I you know I know you pretty well bud I can tell you're a little giddy like how does it feel because I mean you it's not 100% yet I checked Jesse's still playing her yep. round she's also in still live I was you know I was going to tell you what her status was here on stream but we don't know yet H- how are you feeling because it is not 100% locked up yet it is she not. can still win it and I be- like I believe we talked about last night she mm-hmm. wins it you lose in top eight you draw, is that correct? So uh, that's not correct. So oh, what sorry. Jesse needs, what Jesse needs to happen is she needs me to not top it, and then mm-hmm. she needs to win the event. We okay. will be tied on points if that happens, and mm-hmm. then in that case, uh, we believe that she has the tiebreaker of more top eights. Okay, um, interesting. So right. if I if I top eight the event, I am the player of the year. Uh, so I just need a handshake in the last round. All right. Handshake. Well, awesome. so you're probably not going to play for seeding this time, then, huh? <laughs> I'll still try to win the event if I'm there, but the goal is to get a handshake. All right. All right. Impressive stuff. Well, this is kind of the culmination of a year long, you know, mm-hmm. stretch f- for you. Um, any, is there like, what's the emotion right now? Is it, is it relief? Is it joy? Is it, 
Um, satisfaction, like what's uh, what's the uh, primary a feeling? A lot of a lot of joy right now. I know earlier this year when I've um, like winning my first RCQ that the feeling was a lot of relief that I didn't have to drive home and just feeling like I lost. Um, with something like this, Zach and Jesse are both you know good friends of mine and just excellent, excellent competitors. And so, if one of them does end up winning or did end up winning, you know, it was an honor to compete with both of them. Um, and I, I wouldn't be too disappointed about that. So all I'm feeling right now is joy. All right. Well, congratulations to you. Uh, Thank you. We'll see in, well, probably in an hour, maybe yep. less, on whether it is locked up or not. If it is, maybe we'll talk to you again. But for the moment, Connor Mullally sitting strong, potentially for a top eight berth, uh, and also for the MVP. Connor Mullally, thanks for talking with us. And thanks, uh, you guys. Maybe we'll see you in a little bit. In the meantime, we've got our backup match from this round. We got uh, Junji Choi versus Logan Snyder. Another match. Uh, other players trying to make top eight of the event. Okay, we're gonna go in live instead. The there was a long start to the match, a long game one. So we're gonna go in live. We don't even we're not gonna bother with the replay and see how this match is looking right now. A hundred percent. It's so exciting. I love this sort of thing here. And by the way, I just want to say it. Love that interview with Connor. I can tell how much he wanted it. Yeah. So sick. And speaking of wanting it. <laughs> this game is in the midst of it with so many creature lands and stuff on the side from Junji that as the, you know, a blue white player, you've got to be a little worried. It, yeah. I mean, certainly your removal gets a little tax when it can't target things during your own turn. Supreme verdict, not so effective against Den the bugbear. Uh, and we do have what graveyard trespasser and what else we got bone crusher giant coming into play here, but lots of cards in Logan Snyder's hand end up a game. So let's see how this is going to progress here. Yeah. Remember day he lose here from Logan. This is a normally a big turning point for the Pioneer control decks. They are wanting to resolve this card after interacting a little bit in the early game. Find that last perfect tool to solidify the board state and then slam it to Fairy here of Dominaria. And we're seeing Logan here just sort of, you know, check out the tools, make sure they're getting the right tools for the job. And this could be the start of the turning point of something like Supreme Verdict was found or maybe slow rolled here from Logan. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, let's take a look. Uh, there is actually maybe two Teferis in hand. Seems Not, to be the case. Yeah. All right. We are going to see one here. Well, presumably five mana being tapped. Yeah, there we go. Teferi, Hero of Dominaria into play here. So the ideal scenario would be to have an empty border one opposing creature as opposed to two, but it still does generate advantage. And uh, we'll see what Logan's able to set up here. Yeah, this might also be a spot from Logan where he's trying to get Junji to commit to the board. Mm -hmm. And then we have this backup to Fairy. So we don't even care that much. And, you know, we just need to find something like Supreme Verdict. It were, you know, any sort of thing we want to have happen, just slow the game down and make it about this to Fairy that we only need one to win. We don't have to have this second or even third to Fairy. So, mm -hmm. all right. Now, a pretty sizable attack in the waiting for, for Junji here with, with two, what, four power creatures in play. Plus, mm -hmm. choice of creature lands. Yeah, uh, this... Logan, Logan has to know all this is coming, so I'm sure there's a plan of some sorts. Yeah, and you know, Junji even has Dreadbore to kill the. Even if we had some sort of fog effect, not going to work against Dreadbore as it kills the Teferi here. There is some card in the top of Logan's hand that I am just unable to figure out, even when looking at the deck list here. I, I, I can't help you. I don't know what it is either. <laughs> Uh, oh, oh, oh Soul Partition. Okay, so it's an instant with exile target non-land permanent for as long as this card remains exiled. Its owner may pay a, uh, may play it. A spell cast by your opponent this way costs two more to cast. So it's a little O-ring that then, you know, they can replay the thing for two more mana. Kind of sick. Yeah, kind of, indeed. And uh, actually, uh, something uh, did it. Was it cast on his own Teferi there? I think it was. I think yeah. he used it to save the Teferi, yeah. which is that would explain why Teferi's on the side with a dice on it too. And that's pretty sick from Logan. We talked about, you know, maybe this Teferi's a little bait. It was a little bait for the Dreadbor there. And that can be one of those things where, you know, for Logan, the two more mana, not the end of the world. Teferi not mm -hmm. only gets it back, I want to play a 30 turn game if you're Logan. Yeah. Yeah. Certainly. Okay. So, uh, Junji. Junji does not want to play a 32 game. Junji probably wants to win the game next turn. It's not going to end this turn, even with mm -hmm. a solid attack here. But yeah, come across, chew up some of the graveyard. Yeah, memory deluge 100% yeah. out of there. <laughs> Don't want that one. 
It's only going to lose a life from the blood tithe that Junji is exiling uh, from his mm-hmm. own graveyard, but pretty big here. And this is a matchup show that before the RC and before sort of the kind of churn that's happened with current uh, Pioneer was a heavily favored Rakdos matchup. However, a lot of blue white players have changed their boards and plans. And I know experts like misplaced ginger actually feel the matchup is not super great. And for his RC going on to Canada this weekend, he changed a lot of cards to respect this matchup. So this might be one where, you know, if you're a veteran of pioneer, it's like, you know, Junji has this locked up, but things have changed. The metagame mm-hmm. has churned. And, and that's something I expect to see a lot of. And I think we have already seen it in the last couple of weeks and, and probably going forward. I mean, there are going to be, as the metagame you know, ebbs and flows and priorities change, I think sideboards will change as well. I talked about this a little earlier in the broadcast this morning where I feel like there was insufficient Lotus Field hate in the field. And, and we already saw in Justin Breckman's Blue White deck a couple of um, damping spheres that uh, I believe a month ago weren't there. And so there's going to be shifts in other ways, like you're talking about. Maybe these blue white decks are more equipped for Rakdos nowadays than they were before. So yeah, I'm excited to see how the format uh, changes over the next month or two. 100. percent Yeah, we see it become daytime again, and I love this end of turn stomp. Your card might be an instant Joe, but we can play it at sorcery speed and just make these dinner the bugbears lethal. Yeah, yeah, nice indeed. All right, so Logan Snyder down to three. Uh, chat pointing out that uh, misspoke on the. Soul Partition only taxes the card if it's your opponent. So for yourself, it's still going to cost regular price. But uh, Logan on the hunt here cycles a sensor. Looking, what are we even looking for at this point? It's got to be a, a, a sizable creature, right? A sweeper is not going to do it. Nope. Okay. Well, yeah. nothing found is going to help, and we're <laughs> going to see a game three. Yeah, I think the out there was maybe having something like the Wandering Emperor plus a spot removal spell. I don't know. Maybe mm-hmm. Verdict plus that. It was going to be hard, but you know. We still have game three here, so we might have to see that later in the match. But yeah, just you know, also nothing wrong with taking a redraw real quick. It takes, you know, one second. And if you forgot something in your deck list, uh, might as well check. Yeah. All right. So let's go ahead and take a look at the deck list and see what may be this slightly revamped uh, blue white control deck in Pioneer. So we had, we do have new cards. We have, two, we have two Soul Partitions main deck. Okay. Yeah. That is certainly uh, a relatively recent development. Yeah, and from the sideboard, we have the Lyra Dawnbringer, which I know has become part of the plan for some blue-white players against Black-Red. Hullbreaker as well is pretty good there. Steinheim Unleashed. This is the Fortel card that makes a bunch of angels as much mm-hmm. as you want. Joe, you might know this card. It's a kind of maybe an old favorite of yours with Intrigue the Angels, you know, a riff on it. And yeah. It seems strong here. Yeah, no, it does. I mean, not being able to be uh, cast instant speed off of a Divine Top, what do we care? I mean, the Black-Red opponent doesn't, mat- doesn't care. There's a bunch of angels either way. Uh, going to you know generate a sizable board presence uh kind of out of nowhere and that's the kind of thing that's that's tough i mean what is black red effectively going to do they don't they're great at you know one for oneing and then you know eking out small card advantage it's there's no easy way to answer you know three angels mm-hmm 100%, yeah. And it looks like we're back here as players of finishing Millie. That might be a, a key card here. Also worth noting, Logan has Laydown Arms in the main deck, a card that a lot of people talked about. Hey, is this the thing we should play in blue-white? Should we play this in mono-white? Didn't quite see play right away, but Logan making a big statement like, hey, my deck has plenty of planes. I am happy to play You know, this one-mana somewhat conditional removal spell. And it seems to be paying off in great spot as Logan here is at uh, four and one in the tournament. Mm-hmm. All right, so Junji will take a mulligan here. Uh, all right, we'll go look at Junji's list since we get a chance a moment ago. Uh, so Black Red mid range. Uh, we also see some some new cards here from Brothers War. We see Misery Shadow in the main deck, which mm-hmm. is, I mean, a nice way to give yourself a boost not just on the clock, but also fighting against some of the Green Devotion uh, graveyard tricks. Mm-hmm. Pretty big there. And in the sideboard, we have Go Blank and Duress and Reckoner Bankbuster. All those cards we can bring in and sort of trim on things like Fatal Plush. You know, they don't really have many targets and just make some small upgrades in other spots and just sort of have a more lean, consistent deck that can fight through counter spells effectively. Mm-hmm. You know, these discard spells in this matchup typically players think about Thought Seizing on one. Sure, that's strong, but you can use your Thought Seize to clear the way from something like Absorb, etc from the blue white player and then resolve your haymaker card like shieldred and having more things like that with duress is going to be big game for junji in this matchup right and and i think that's exactly why we've seen kind of the uptick over the last two months or so more and more of the uh, foretell cards coming to play to try and dodge discard Mm -hmm. so there is counterplay on both sides which is 
what makes it for exciting matches. So let's see if, if Junji can uh, come up with a six here that's going to work. Yeah, it look, looks like he's actually down to five cards, which is All right. a pretty big difference there. Yeah, we see Junji is sort of like, okay, I've got lands and spells. Am I putting these two back? Okay. It does look like we have a Blood Tithe Harvester. So we got something going. And we're on the draw. And, you know, in this matchup, being on the play is always strong. But this might be a spot where you know, it's not the end of the world to be on the draw. Right. Unless Logan has Sensor, which I can't quite make out the last card in his hand, but I think it is blue. And that, that means it could be Sensor. All right. Well, that will be a bit painful. I mean, there is. So, okay. It's going to be a Fortel card. Uh, and Junji does have Fable as well, I think. So, yeah, Sensor is going to be live almost at any point. Yep, here's and, Blood Tithe. And you talked about, you know, maybe not firing off Thoughts right away. And yeah, Junji does decide to deploy Blood Tithe Harvester first. Yeah, it's just, uh, you know, it's the thing where it's really tempting if you're playing this matchup, just like, hey, make sure everything's clear before I start exploding. I don't want to get blown out by Verdict. I don't want to get blown out by these cards. But you got to get some pressure so that your opponent doesn't have infinite time to resolve something like a Teferi. As we see the lay down arms take care of that pressure. So it's really forcing Junji to sort of keep doing this. And maybe, you know, it's sort of a squeeze where in theory you want to wait. Yeah, but you can't give them forever. Otherwise, they just get to resolve their cards. It's, looks like I saw it coming. Okay, well, that will protect the hand here. Uh, Junji's going to take a look at Saw coming, so we can pop that up. This is a Fortel Counterspell. Three mana to hard cast, two when it's coming out of the Fortel Exile Zone. Yeah, big, big game on that card. You know, with when you only have that in your deck, it's a real like, kind of ha-ha moment. But with Steinholm Unleashed, mm -hmm. it's actually really big game. And I don't know if Junji knows that. And it might be a thing where Logan didn't show that card in game two. But if he had, that might be a spot where he's actually caught off guard. And it could still come up with multiple Sot Cummings in the deck. And Junji is not an open deckless tournament. It's very different than the RC. You don't know exactly what you're playing around. And that's mm -hmm. why these hidden information cards are so much more powerful there. Yeah, yes, indeed. So options here for, for Junji include Fable and Hardcast Bone Crusher Giant, I believe. I'm trying to figure out what the right way to approach this is down on cards there's nothing he can do about that he'll just have to work his way back which is you know making a card disadvantage for mulligans it's tough sometimes but it, it but it's, it can happen all right playing around center here and plays another blood type harvester yeah and i respect playing around this uh sensor when you're on the mulligan to five because it can be really easy right joe when you're in this spot to be like i'm playing for like a pretty good spot in the tournament i'm old five whatever i'm just going to give up no, Junji has the chance to actually afford to play around this and not have a, you know an anemic play. It'd be different if he wasn't doing anything, but Blood Tithe Harvester is a real amount of pressure, and the Blood Token lets him fix his draw a little bit. Mm -hmm. All right, so do we see it? No? Okay, he's happy with his hand. And it also tells Logan Snyder Junji is fairly happy with the hand. Yeah, this might be a moment, too, where Junji's like, listen, winning this game in a timely way, that time has passed. My opponent's <laughs> up two mana. This is a 30-turn game again, just like our game one was, apparently. I am going to need this blood token for my ninth land in the future, not to find one now. As Junji's finally decided to deploy a card into Sensor, does Logan have it? Well, Logan does have it. Does Logan want to use it? There is Supreme Verdict in hand, so conceivably it could just be held for now. And yeah, it looks like Behold the Multiverse is going to be picked off from the graveyard. And here is Memory Deluge. So the card's mm -hmm. flowing freely into Logan's hand here. Yeah, and Logan, this is a big thing. We talked about how important it was when we first jumped in, that Memory Deluge is sort of that card where you find the things you're looking for and turn the corner. The difference between this game and last is Junji just can't apply the same amount of pressure because mm -hmm. of the mana choke, and we have it rolled up with the Supreme Verdict this time. So when we pick up this Lyra from Logan, that card in two turns is going to be a huge presence if we don't even just play it now as a way of saying, hey, extend more into my Wrath if you want to. All right, let's see. It uh, That's four mana. That's going to be Supreme Verdict. Okay, so Logan decides to clean up the board now. Junji, you can try and rebuild, and then maybe we'll drop the Lyra Dawnbringer, which, yeah, I mean, that card is a house. Whether it's named Lyra Dawnbringer or Baneslayer Angel or going way back, I guess, even compared to the power level of time, Sarah Angel may have been on the same power level. Oh, yeah, Sarah Angel OG definitely was on the same power level there. Uh Speaking of on the same power level, a few things have pioneered on the power level of Fable the Mirror Breaker, and it's finally making its debut in this game. And, you know, I think I liked where Junji was. You know, he did have the Rion Sensor, and as you see Logan be like, all right, 
you're rewarded. You know, whether you win or lose this game, you played around it well. I'm going to take my card now and just move on with the day. Okay. Ooh, Shark Typhoon to pick up here for Logan. So hard cast, hard uh, cast. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, there's time. Uh, if it's ever going to happen, you know, I, sitting at 15 I, life, it's not unreasonable. I would be hard pressed. If like I would take probably a supercomputer to tell me that it's hundred percent wrong to play Shark Typhoon here. I need a computer that can run all the alg the all the different stuff, but also Twitch chat wants the hard cast Shark Typhoon. And we gotta appease them, you know. We gave them a mono green mirror. We have to give them something else to like, you know, that's, that's quell their great, appetite. Right? <laughs> yeah, that's fair. Maybe next turn. Maybe, maybe, uh, maybe Logan will will see the opportunity next turn. If this Larry Dawnbringer lives survives, uh it's probably not gonna take too much, but uh We'll see here as Junji is trying to decide if any cards need to be replaced. It looks like the choice is for the maximum two, and there's a duress. So Shark Typhoon may potentially be revealed. Not like this. Looks like we also have a Dreadbore, so this might be a duress into Dreadbore, and this is what we talked about before. We can use our discard spells to make sure, hey, there's no Dovin Vito in the way, right? Mm -hmm. Cool. You know, you want to take this? Wow, so this Soul Partition, yeah, can protect... The Lyra Dawnbringer. Uh, and Junji, this is this is not a good I mean, you're hoping to see, you know, three landed to fairy. You're like, okay, I could maybe live with that, but uh, that's not what he found. Yeah, and it's an awkward spot too, where you know, traditionally, like you mentioned, you just love to take the Teferi, even if you had to take the shark typhoon here, you know, you, you kind of wish it is an easy choice and not one you to think about because that soul perdition can save this Lyra if we do go to Dreadboard here. And we saw this trick in the last game, so Junji maybe wants this play to happen. So we see Logan tank on it. Yeah. It some, seems pretty good. It, yeah. There is some hesitancy, though. Logan kind of wants to hold on to it. But nope. Okay, there it is. Lyra goes to not quite the Fortel zone, I guess, but uh, that area over there. The Aether. Yes, exactly. <laughs> and all right, Fable comes or Fable Token comes across, generates a treasure. Uh, Junji not exactly bottlenecked on mana at this point, but pretty mana-hungry decks with creature lands and such, so all the treasures, I'm sure, are welcome. Yep. Oh, and you have, and with all the creature lands, too, and Castle Lockthwain, this deck is always happy to have, you know, a little extra mana laying around. That's why you see it play so many lands for a deck that, you know, its curve really is that, like, three, you know, but once again, you do want to be double spelling and stuff, and Speaking of wow. curving, this farewell might be game ending. Yeah, this is brutal. And it's a perfect time for Logan to cast it as he doesn't have a board presence right now. Cast that. Give Junji the finger and move <laughs> on with your day. <laughs> that is the case of what's happening metaphorically and physically there as we resolve this card. You know what? This is the reason not to cast your, your Shark Typhoon, Joe. It's because you're gonna, you might true. have to exile it. Yeah. Yeah. Heartbreaking. We are going to see a blood get popped here. You know, we're not happy with whatever card we have. Understandable. And Junji's in a hard spot. The Lyra is just whenever it wants to come back, it can come back. Mm -hmm. We have this lay down arms for any threat we have. And the Teferi, you're just sort of begging to find some sort of discard spell probably here. Okay. So another fable. I mean, that's. That's something here for Junji. Can improve the hand next turn. Have it rebuild a board presence. But uh, Logan's playing on a different axis now. There's there's a lot going on. Here is um, removal for the Fable token. And then are we yeah, going to see Teferi coming? And there's only three minutes left in the round, Joe. So Logan's got a pretty good grasp on this game. Mm -hmm. Just needs to be like, okay, how do I want to finish this? And what angle am I going to go? And it looks like we might be planning for the Teferi ultimate route which is pretty close here. And also make sure that when we do go for our Lyra, she's actually protected as we picked up an absorb as well. And we have the untap from Teferi. It's going to be so hard for Junji to get anything of impact on the board. Yeah. Uh, let's see. We're not. Oh, oh I see. We're foretelling there. Oh, okay. So probably a saw it coming, uh, getting foretelled as I think it was a blue card in hand. So this is a pretty, pretty interesting spot here. And we see the Fable of the Mirror Breaker ticked up to two. Looks like we're playing out a turn. We might just be not looting and just casting our two spells here and hoping it's enough. Well, getting the fairy off the board feels like a, a must. 
And then, yeah, okay, Blood Tithe Harvester. I mean, that actually... Oh, oh, I forgot the blood got reset by the Farewell. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, it would have been maybe enough to take down the Lyra, but nope. And it is Absorbent Hand. You're right about that in Logan's hand. So here we see Starnham unleashed <laughs> for however uh, much Logan feels is appropriate. It looks to be a bunch. This has got to be having war flashbacks for you right now. Yeah, doing no, this in the future, Mr. <laughs> no, this is this is how you do it. This is you go, you play careful, and then when they're like, "Oh, time's about to run out," you're like, "Okay, I'll put twenty power on the board." <laughs> yeah, that's, a, that's like, how you do it. <laughs> no, that's fair. Yeah, and, and you know, only twelve for the modern day version of this card, but still more than enough. And ironically, she <laughs> at twenty four, so it's a clean clock as well as we see. Uh, Fable the Mirror Breaker transform the reflection of Kiki Jiki. So we do need to answer that card. Otherwise, maybe the Blood Tithe Harvesters have enough. But we've got a good amount of force to win the game with now. Okay. All right. Let's figure this out. Yeah, the board actually got complicated. And then this card on the bottom here that just got played. That's a Shielded, right? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. That's the one. Okay. So Junji actually can survive two swings now. I love Logan's use of the red zone. Gets in there. And I, you know, Logan looks like he's drew the land, but has absorb and fell well. So, yeah, gets to play the Lyra, and we might have to lose both Blood Tithe Harvesters if we want to kill the Lyra. Lyra actually does buff Angels as well, Joe. <laughs> yeah, I was thinking about that for a second. I was like, is it is it bluff Angels? Like, oh, it's probably just Legends. But yeah, it's so the uh, pre combat there would have uh, picked up an extra three damage in life, right? Yeah, yeah, I believe it would have been a huge swing Actually, there. Actually, yeah, not not just three life. It would have been a ton of life. Yeah, you know, luckily for Logan, we're in a spot where this might not be the end of the world. But, mm -hmm. you know, good enough as is, it's presenting lethal on the next turn, even with Junji having the life gain from Shieldred, in, even in combination with the blood, forcing the Lyra to be answered. And, yeah, Junji might just be forced into, like, copying a Blood Tithe Harvester, and just sacrificing both to kill the Lyra so that he has some more time to recoup and maybe grant out of this in combination with some more kill spells. But like we mentioned, things like Fatal Push, we cut from our deck. We only have mm -hmm. a few cards like Dreadbore left in our deck to actually do something. And you just that tactically don't play for these games. And that's why having these strong pivot cards are so strong. All right. So what are realistically options here? Okay, we're on turns now. So here is if if the play you talked about copy blood tithe use them both to kill Lyra, then Shieldred conceivably could attack into the tokens because it would take down two of them. Yeah, yeah, and since Logan did not get the twelve, sorry the mm -hmm. uh, the fifteen life, Logan's life is actually under duress currently. So Shieldred attacks, gets in. Junji can make the attack again. Looks like. Oh, looks like Junji used a Blood Tithe Harvester on one of the tokens. Did not know the Lyra text, so the token survived. Um, okay, that's yeah, that's painful there. Uh, and now this is a this should do it. Th uh, that should. I was like going to pop a blood and see if we have any instant speed kill spell. Maybe I it actually can't be power word kill. That doesn't kill angels. No, it, ha <laughs> it has to be a go for the throat here. And I don't know if Junji has that one. He has Power Word Kill as his kill spell. That's uh, a go and blank, and that is not going to be enough. And Logan Snyder will advance to 5-1 and one with uh, a whole squadron of angels. Uh, nice work, Logan, after my own heart. And uh, Junji Choi fought hard there, but being two cards down, um, that's tough. Okay, that was the last ma match of the round. So we're going to hit a break real quick and come back with the last round of the Swiss. It's Joe Lissette and Mason Clark from New Rage Gaming. We'll be right back. <laughs> 